Hey, hey, y'all. Welcome to the Intro to Backend Development course. There's almost 70 of y'all. I hope that all of you are as excited to be taking the course as we are to be teaching it. My name is Rahi. I'm going to be one of your co-instructors for this semester. Jack is the other co-instructor. As you can see, I'm going to be the one recording the lecture for today. Jack will be posting the demo. That's not necessarily going to be consistent. It'll change week to week depending on who really feels like doing which part. But anyways, today's lecture will have some content in it, but at the beginning I wanted to dive into kind of some logistics about how the course is going to be run and how it's going to be structured throughout the semester, right? One of the main things is if you haven't already, make sure to enroll on Student Center. The course is CS 1998 section 606. Enroll for two credits because, you know, that's just the standard active course registration. Um, the main thing is join the Slack. You should have gotten an email with a ton of logistical information about what's going to happen this semester, and in that email was a Slack link. That Slack link is very important. It's where all of our announcements are going to go up. If we have any information we need to update you on, that'll be in the Slack. If you want to ask questions about the lecture content, there's a channel in the Slack for that. Make sure you join the Slack. That's pretty much mandatory for the semester. The office hour schedule isn't out yet, but it should be up by Wednesday on the textbook syllabus page. If you don't know how to get to the textbook, go to the Cornell Aptive website, then go to the backend course page, and there's a link to the textbook there. It's a super great resource to help you review content and look for more information. So the structure. As you can see from what's been posted today, there's going to be a weekly lecture and demo posted. What's the difference? Why are we posting these two things? Well, the lecture is very concept heavy. We're going to be teaching you the theory behind like how this runs, what it means for different things to be doing things. So for example, today we're going to be talking about the client server model. What is a client? What is a server? How do they interact with each other? The demo on the other hand is going to be teaching you how to take what you learned in lecture and actually implement it in Python code. Every assignment kind of corresponding to the lecture and the demo, there'll be something due on Sunday. Make sure you keep up with the lecture and the demo because the assignments will be very, very closely related to what we learned that week. We've got to talk about it. Academic dishonesty. We have a zero tolerance policy for academic dishonesty. Have common sense, right? Don't cheat. Don't copy your friend's code in the class and submit it like it's your own. If you find something online that you want to use, cite it. The Cornell has a full list of their academic integrity guidelines that you can look into if you're more interested. Essentially, if we find out that you have committed an AI violation, we're just going to drop you from the course. All of you guys are here, you all had to apply to take the course. I assume you don't want that, so... Like I said, just have common sense. So with that, let's, let's talk about what we're actually going to be learning in the course, right? What is backend? Well, we'll talk about routes. So like, if you type something into your browser bar, your URL bar, what happens to that? That's what's called a route. We'll talk about databases. If you are on YouTube, for example, all of those videos have to be stored somewhere, right? It's not like your phone just has all of YouTube loaded at all times. It's stored in a database somewhere in a server, right? So we'll talk about those. We'll talk about how to abstract things from kind of lower level code to something that's more easier, in my opinion, to write. Containerization, it's fine if you don't know what that means right now because you will at that point. Deployment, let's say you've gotten something working on your computer. How do you, how do you get it running on the internet so that somebody from their phone or from their computer can access this feature or this application that you've made? All of this throughout the semester is going to be building up to the hack challenge. So what is the hack challenge? Well, it's kind of like a mini app dev hackathon. You'll be working with people from the other courses to, within a few weeks, create an actual functioning app. You'll really see how much you've learned throughout the semester. It's a great experience for you to get some, some actual experience creating a project. This is a real project you guys will have made. You'll have built an app, right? You'll submit it to, to the course, and then the judges for the hackathon will be the course instructors. So we'll be giving awards based off different categories we've decided for the Hack Challenge. More information about the Hack Challenge will come 
as we get closer to it. But for now, start getting hyped for that. So like I mentioned before, uh, we're going to be your instructors. Jack's on the left there, I'm on the right. And with that, I think we're ready to begin. So let's get into the actual content for today's lecture. Like I mentioned before, the client-server model. Well, the client-server model is clearly made up of two things, right? There's the client, and then there's the server. So what are those two things? Well, let's talk about it piece by piece, right? First is the client. And the client is really just kind of any computer that you have. It can be your phone, your laptop, your Apple Watch, even. The idea behind a client is it'll run some code on its device. That's what we'll often refer to as the front end of the application. Let's go back to the YouTube example, right? You open up YouTube, you're scrolling through, and you say, hey, what's, what's my recommended, YouTube? And there's a little button for you to see your recommended. You can look at what's trending, you can look at your subscriptions. Anything that you are directly interacting with on YouTube, that's the front end. That's what's being run locally on your laptop. But YouTube has to get that information from somewhere. And that's where the other part of the client-server model kicks in. That's the server part. So, okay, what's a server? A server is also just a computer. But it's a computer that, very important, the client can access. So the client will somehow send some sort of request to the server for information, and the server will return what the client wants. So you open YouTube and you say, hey, can I see all of the videos by, I don't know, Jax Films, for example? And YouTube's like, oh yeah, I can do that for you. But then let's say you want to say, can I see my subscriptions, please, YouTube? And YouTube's like, sure, but I'm going to have to know who you are. So this is really a conversation between the client and the server. The client will sometimes send information along with just a request for information. In this case, it'll send who is trying to access the information so the server can figure out what videos they should show. The issue is, what happens in the middle? We know that they're communicating with each other, but how? What are they actually saying to each other? What's, what's the protocol for this? What's the consistency? Let's talk about client-server communication. This is a URL that hopefully all of you recognize. Let's spend a couple of minutes dissecting it. That HTTP is something that you all are probably very familiar with seeing stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and that's essentially just a language, not necessarily in the coding language sense, but in like a spoken language sense, that the clients and the servers will use to communicate with each other so that they can understand each other. It defines what the server is expecting to see from the client and what the client is expecting to get back from the server. It's one of the most ubiquitous internet protocols out there, so we're gonna be covering stuff related to that. Next is the actual google.com part, and that's what's called a domain name. Something to keep in mind is that a domain isn't the same thing as a server. A domain name is what it sounds like. Imagine if Google was a person, right? Just having their name isn't going to tell you where to get them. If you wanted to contact Google, knowing that their name is Google isn't going to tell you how to talk to them. You need an address to mail them. So domain names can actually get translated into what's called an IP or internet protocol address through what's called the DNS or domain name system. You can think of the DNS kind of like the internet's address book. You ask the DNS, hey, uh, could you tell me where Google lives? And the DNS spits out some numbers back at you and it says, hey, Google lives here. You're like, great. Then now that you know where Google is, you can start sending them requests of information, you can start mailing them things, and then Google will start mailing you things back. I've been using the word request a lot here, right? So what is a request? Like I've mentioned before, a request is initiated by a client. It's kind of the client sending some information to a server and saying, hey, could you give me some information back or could you maybe update some information you have? The request is made up of the URL, which is what we saw with the google.com thing earlier. Some methods to indicate what you're trying to do. So are you trying to just get some information? Do you want to maybe change some information we know about you? Change your username, for example, change your password? Or maybe you need to send us some data to help us along with that. So if you 
we're opening Instagram, maybe you need to upload an image. You should send that image to the server. Let's go through that piece by piece. The URL is also known as an endpoint or a route. We'll kind of be using those terms interchangeably. That tells you when you get to the server, what should we be doing with this information? What's interesting about URLs is they can actually incorporate data too. I mentioned before that data is in the body. The body isn't the only place data can be. For example, if you're just trying to retrieve information from Google, you don't really need to send Google any information. You can just say, hey Google, I want some pictures of dogs and cats. And you can somehow incorporate that into the request URL so that you don't have to send Google anything really of your own data. So there are four different kinds of request method. I said Google a lot, so my phone activated. Let's turn that off. Four types of really main operations we're going to be going through, and those are, you know, abbreviated CRUD. So let's go through CRUD, right? The C in CRUD stands for create. So if you want to maybe make a new account or log in, you're kind of creating information on the server. In, if you're logging in, you're creating a user session. If you're creating an account, you're obviously you know, creating an account. Retrieval is what I've been talking about a lot. So if you want to, to Google pictures of dogs and cats, you just type in dog and cat, and then it retrieves that for you. Update, delete, in a similar vein. We'll usually be referring to these things as post, get, put, and delete. Those just correspond to their CRUD counterparts. If you're creating information, then if you think of it like a mailing system, you'll be posting some information to the server so that it knows what to create. Similarly, put, you can put some information back where there was information before to update it. Retrieval turns into get, that one makes sense, and delete stays delete because it's nice. So these CRUD operations will get translated to post, get, put, and delete. That's often called a RESTful API. Now let's get to the request body. This is really just how you want to send some extra data to the server that it might need. And there are a bunch of different formats, for example, just text to JSON. If you go to google.com, what will actually get returned to you is a bunch of HTML code that your browser understands how to render to your screen. You can send, for example, username and password. Like I mentioned before, you can upload an image to Instagram. The main thing to keep in mind, the body isn't the only place to send data. You can send data in the URL, like the dog and cat thing. But it is one of the most flexible ways of sending data, and that makes it one of the most useful. If all of this is sounding really vague, we'll be going into some examples just in a bit. Like this! Perfect! Let's go through some example requests. So this is just a get request to google.com slash search question mark to equals query. Let's dissect this again. This time we know it's a get request. We're retrieving information. Go back to the CRUDs. We know we're going to, Google doc, to the Google domain. Let's ask the DNS where that lives, and then go to Google. Then the, the, the slash search tells us what we're trying to do. Well, now that we're at Google, we're trying to search, right? It tells us the operation we want to do. Then the last part. Those are query parameters. This is the way that you can send data while you're just trying to retrieve. Get requests actually can't have a request body because you're not, you're not trying to send them any information, you're just trying to get information. But you need to tell them what kind of information you want to get. So you say some key, in this case the key is Q, equals whatever your query is. So you could actually type this into Google. You could type google.com slash search question mark Q equals dog or Q equals dog plus cat. And that will give you results of dogs because you're browser will automatically send a GET request to that and then render the HTML that it sends back. You also don't just necessarily have to have one key. If you look, you can have key one equals value, so Q equals dog, and then key two equals another value. You can string these together if you need to send more information than just that. This is a login post request. So, you know, login request, posting information to the server to log in. In this case, it's not a slash search, it's a slash login, right? Again, we're just going through the operations. This is an example of a request body. Specifically, this one is in a JSON format, saying what the username is versus the 
password and stuff like that. A lot of what we'll be doing in this class is sending JSONs. Make sure not to forget the double quotes. Python can use single quotes and double quotes interchangeably. JSON files cannot. Something to bear in mind. Well, okay, now we've talked about how the client can ask the server for something, but what does the server say back? Well, it sends back a response, and the response is formatted very similarly to a request with the addition of something called a response code. And a response code just gives a kind of vague idea of how the request went. So if it says 200, hey, your request went well. Here's the information you wanted. If it's a 404. I'm sure you guys have seen error 404, not found. That's the website trying to say, hey, I have no clue what you were trying to look for, but it's not here. This is on you. Whereas 500 is saying, oh, this one's our bad. Something horribly wrong happened in the survey. Request, re sorry, response codes. The first number will often tell you a lot about, about a lot about them. For example, 200 codes, or numbers starting with two, will usually be success codes. 400 codes will usually be some sort of bad request code, whereas 500 codes will be something went wrong on the server side. For example, 401 is an unauthorized error. You tried accessing information you weren't authorized to get. That's your fault. 400, your fault. Example responses, right? Let's go back through and dissect some of these. So you try getting this, and this would be slightly weirder for you to test out because, like I mentioned before, if you actually try getting this, it'll send you a bunch of HTML. But for sake of argument, let's say it sent you this JSON, formatted very nicely as the body. Well, the status code is 200, so we know that the request went well. And then it's saying, okay, we got 100 results, here's a list of them. Simple. So now if we want to log in, you set the username and password, Google says, hey, that went well, status code 200. But what if your username and password were wrong? Then it sends a different status code for the 401, unauthorized, success false, and then it'll maybe prompt you to try again. You could do a bunch of different things server side depending on that. The important thing is now the client understands that they did something wrong or that something went wrong server side. They're not left hanging in case something goes wrong. So let's recap. The client and the server communicate. First, the client sends a request to the server. Although, really first, keep in mind they're accessing the DNS to find out where the server even is. Then the server sees the request, figures out which route, which thing you want to do with that request, runs some sort of data operation on it, so gathering all the information you want, or creating a user session for you if you're trying to log in. Then it just returns the response back to the client. Client knows they've logged in, client gets their Google search results or their YouTube recommended. That's all for today. Hopefully that wasn't too much in the first lecture. You're gonna have your first assignment this week due Sunday. If you're worried, thinking, I have no idea what to do based off what I just saw in the lecture, that's valid. That means it's time for you to watch the demo because the demo is gonna show you exactly what to do now that you've watched the lecture, how to implement all this request and response stuff in actual code. Hope you guys enjoy that too. Thank you.